Hello, my name is Brian Widener. I'm the Assistant Professor of Instrumental Music Education at Butler University, and I welcome you to today's session on First Attempt in Learning, Embracing Failure in the Ensemble Classroom. Now, I need to give a caveat before we start. Um, I'm going to be using throughout this session um, a four-letter word that oftentimes is not considered to be appropriate within our classrooms, and I'm going to encourage you to use it within yours. And that four-letter word is fail, F-A-I-L. As performers, um, we oftentimes uh, try to hide the concept of failure away, making it something that no one sees except for us. It's something that happens on our own, but certainly it's not something that occurs within a public space. It works against our performance and our competitive instincts, um, and it goes against that concept of polished presentation. Um, as a teacher in my own classroom, um, when I was a, a high school teacher, I recall having a sign over my door that was uh, showed what is here, this concept that repeated practice makes perfect. And what's important in this is that word perfect within this. There's an emphasis upon the fact that perfection is our goal. Um, and importantly, that failure is not an option along that. Now, we could certainly read into that and see that uh, and make the argument that, well, the failure happens in other spaces or whatever it might be. But we continually present this mantra to our students that failure is not something that is acceptable or appropriate for our classrooms. So my own interest in failure as a teacher came out of my own research, um, which was really built around the question of how do students become musically independent? I had the great opportunity to go and observe um, a half dozen different uh, high school band directors as they worked in their classrooms to develop musical independence. And um, to make a long story short, found that there were three really common elements that were in place within these classrooms. One, students had agency to make decisions. Second, um, students had significant opportunities to engage in critical problem solving all the way through. And last but not least, all this leads to the fact that the teachers were emphasizing opportunities for lifelong musicianship um, in every stage of their classroom. Now, there was a common element that ran within all three of these settings of student agency, critical problem solving, and lifelong musicianship. And that's the idea that opportunities for students to fail exist at every single step. As successful professional musicians, we've all figured out that we have to navigate failure. And in order to be successful as musicians, that navigation of failure is something that professionally we've figured out. I think importantly though, we oftentimes don't allow our students to see that failure take place. We emphasize in our classrooms the concept of coming prepared so that mistakes are not made. We emphasize with our students that what we're going for is making sure that we can repeat excellent performance in every stage. Um, while we acknowledge that failure is something that occurs to each and every one of us, um, we hide those failures away so no one, and importantly, our students don't see us struggle. Now, this is something that doesn't happen in other areas um, that require an equal level of practice and time. Within the sciences, we have the famous apocryphal statement by Thomas Edison in regards to the invention of the light bulb. I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. In the science community, there's an embracement of failure as one of the first stages towards success. Uh, more recently, and um, quite uh, publicly, Elon Musk of SpaceX uh, makes very loud statements whenever one of his rockets literally explodes, um, touting the fact that what they've discovered, as uh, stated in the, this text, or this tweet rather, uh, from 2015, at least it should explode for a different reason next time. Not only is failure something that's accepted, it's expected within these spaces, realizing that those steps towards failure are what build success. And just for your moment of zen, um, here's a quick glimpse of one of those rockets exploding, taken straight off of Elon Musk's own Twitter feed. When we transition and start looking at the business world, we find that failure is something that is um, readily accepted uh, within uh, areas of venture capitalism. And it's important to note here that within the business community and science community as well and other areas, um, failure can certainly be something that is negative. Um, when that failure is due to negligence, when it's due to lack of preparation, um, failure is not seen as a positive. But by contrast, um, that experience of failure is seen as something that's not only acceptable but praiseworthy 
when it's about um, taking risk, when it's about exploratory testing, when it's about having a vision and moving towards that vision. Uh, venture capitalism specifically thrives in this space of rewarding creativity and in many ways disregarding failure as millions of dollars are invested in great ideas with the knowledge that many of those great ideas will never work out. Um, those venture capitalists um, invest in innovators who may have three or four failures before they finally have a success. But the reality is those successes uh, become the Ubers of the future um, that are multi-million dollar um, enterprises that can move forward. But that doesn't happen unless failure is experienced first. So for me, this revelation around failure was walking into the classrooms of great teachers and as part of my research and seeing um, that within their classrooms, failure was first of all acknowledged. Uh, the signs that you see here are ones that were posted prominently within the classroom. As you notice, the word fail is not something that was run away from. The concept of making mistakes was something that was embraced. This idea that mistakes are just proof that you're trying. And we can see that this wasn't only something that the teachers embraced, uh, but the sign that you see at the bottom is a sign that was made for one of the band's marching bands uh, by their leadership team, reminding students that failure is something that comes in process. Failure was celebrated in these classrooms, and importantly, it was not candy-coated. Um, there was a concept that um, it's appropriate to feel disappointment when you fail, that failure is something that happens, that there's an inner dialogue that comes with it, but importantly, that failure was the first step towards being successful. As one of the teachers that I worked with stated, if it's worth doing, it's worth failing at, and it's worth failing at repeatedly. I um, want to share the voices of one of those teachers. Uh, this is Ms. Simek. Um, the name is, uh, is a uh, pseudonym uh, to protect her identity and her program. Uh, but I think what she says really captures some of the reasons why failure was something that was important for these communities. So after tons of conversations, tons of committee meetings and stuff, I realized that we're, we're afraid we're afraid to tell the kids it's okay to fail. Like mm -hmm. we, we are scared poopless to say, yeah, take a risk, mm -hmm. fail. Now we as teachers all say, oh yeah, let's take risks. Encourage your kids to take risks, blah, blah. Well, how do you do that? Tell them it's okay to fail. So perhaps you're asking yourself at this point, why should I include failure within my program? Um, why not just push for excellence in every step? Um, and what I'm the primary argument I'm going to make is that by embracing failure, we're embracing the opportunity for students to become independent musicians who can work away from us. Um, in order to become successful, um, we typically have to encounter the inability of doing something. That inability helps support our competence because we learn what we don't know, and we can't learn what we don't know if we haven't gone through that experience first. Second, um, this idea of uh, failure really helps emphasize the autonomy of our students. Um, students can't do things um, oftentimes without our support. And without failure, we're holding our students within their safety zone. Uh, we certainly don't want to throw our students in the deep end. Um, as one of the teachers uh, liked to state, uh, my first year students aren't ready for Lincoln Shire Posey, so I'm not going to put them there yet but I'm certainly gonna put them into positions where they're gonna struggle, where they're gonna encounter frustration because it's through that frustration that they grow. Um, we have to work hard before we learn to run. Importantly, by embracing failure within our classroom, uh, we incorporate both the acceptance of failure and an empathy for others' failure. For ourselves, um, this is about building on what we, what, sorry, building what we can't do on what we can do. It's about seeking solutions um, for problems once they're identified. And that identification happens through processes of failure. Similarly, there's a social emotional skill that's learned here, which is that we have to learn to accept others' failures, recognizing the fact that everyone is not going to succeed, succeed in every sense, that we have to learn how to deliver constructive criticism, that we have to recognize that we all have shortcomings and that those shortcomings can be overcome through collaboration and support. Last, and I think most importantly, by embracing failure, by utilizing failure within our classrooms, we prepare our students for a lifetime of musicianship. Um, our hope is that when our students leave our classroom, they continue to be active musicians. We hope that they continue to embrace music as part of their lives and that they continue to grow as musicians, that they don't finish our programs off and never go beyond that. But in being independent musicians who are shaping their own musicianship, 
there's a key component here that the students um, are going to encounter failure in the future. They're going to encounter difficulties that they don't know how to overcome at first. And they need to learn how to, first of all, not shut down, but second, recognize how to move forward from those. So as um, we take a look at uh, what I found in working with just really phenomenal teachers who have brought failure into their classroom, um, we're going to focus on um, three core areas. First of all, how they create a classroom that embraces failure as part of their classroom environment. Second, how they teach for failure. And third, and importantly, how their students respond to that. So first and foremost, when we're looking at you, um, embracing failure within the classroom, there's a sense that came in all these classrooms that they use failure as an acknowledgement. It is not a disparagement. Uh, fail is not a four letter word. And um, it's calling the experience, calling the thing that the students are doing a failure. Importantly, this is not identifying the student as a failure. Students fail, students succeed. Musicians fail, musicians succeed, as opposed to that musician is a failure. Um, by making failure an acknowledgement, we make it that it's okay to recognize the fact that we didn't succeed. Um, when we're looking at this idea of failure as acknowledgement, I um, found several really specific terms that came up um, in many um, different ways in rubrics, in conversations, that we used to disguise the word failure. Um, instead of saying failure, we talk about skills that need development. We talk about shortcomings that need to be worked upon, critical areas of study, or the not yet successes. And while these certainly create a positive environment, they also lessen the importance of the fact that we have experienced something that wasn't success. Um, within these classrooms, these sort of uh, shorthand terms for failure were put aside and instead the word failure was called out. And one of my favorite examples, uh, I walked into the classroom to observe one day and the students had written the word failure list on the board. And underneath it, students had come up as they set up for the day, writing down all the specific spots within the music that they weren't succeeding, that they had failed at. That became the working list moving forward. Students weren't ashamed to share what they couldn't do. Um, and when we start talking about this, uh, the concept of failure using other shorthands, not yet successes, um, we lessen some of the experience that students themselves are feeling, the shame that comes with failure. And we're going to talk about in a little bit how we address that emotional end of it as well. Um, along with acknowledging failure is existing, we also normalize it. Um, we make sure that students see that failure is a regular step, not an exceptional one, in growth. Um, and there's a, a saying that comes forward that, you know, we walk before we run. Um, by my own observation as a parent, um, I want to put a caveat on that in watching my own children learn to walk, that it wasn't we walk before we run, but we fall down numerous times before we walk. And that happens before we run. Failure isn't an exception to a uh, growth process. It's rather the norm. An important part within all of these classrooms is making failure visible. Um, I was in observing um, a, a teacher the other day and the statement that came up um, as they were working with their students was, failure happens in the practice room. Don't allow it to happen here. And I really want to dissuade you from that sort of mentality. This presumes that students already have all the skills they need in order to be successful on their own. Ideally, we want our classroom spaces to be laboratories for our students. We want it to be a space in which risk-taking can be brought to the forefront, where students feel comfortable in stepping out of their comfort zone. We can only do that if we emphasize the fact that it's really all right to fail. That failure doesn't only happen in the practice room, it happens in the rehearsal hall, it happens in the classroom, it happens in all those spaces, because then we as teachers and the rest of the students as collaborators can step in to help support that student who doesn't have the skills to succeed on their own yet. There's a caveat here in that we need to make sure we distinguish between, as uh, the business world would describe it, productive and destructive failure. Destructive failure happens um, due to inattention, due to lack of preparation, to not taking care of the things that we should be taking care of. And we certainly shouldn't celebrate when a student fails because of that lack of preparation. But by contrast, we need to also recognize that failure happens because students don't have all the skills yet that they need to be successful. And that we can celebrate those moments of failure because it, one, shows that the student is willing to take the risk to move forward, and two, 
they've now been able to identify what it is that they need to work on so that they can be successful as they move forward. Um, want to share again um, the words of um, one of the uh, other teachers in my study, Dr. Evans, um, who talked about how he creates this space that's accepting a failure, recognizing the fact that some students uh, fail because of destructive reasons, some fail because of productive reasons. And I know which kids I can lean on a little bit and mm -hmm. say, you know, that's just not happening. You've got to have that learned by next time. And I know that there are some kids where I can never, ever say that mm -hmm. because that'll just destroy them. But uh, just really trying to get the sense that it's okay to screw up, but not to repeat mistakes. Mm -hmm. Unless it's just a tough thing that you're working out and it's going to progress over time. Right. So to create teaching spaces that allow for failure, um, first and foremost, we need to provide significant opportunities for students to fail. Um, that means selecting literature that works right at the top end of what students can potentially do so that they have numerous opportunities to encounter challenges, which then lead to numerous opportunities to overcome those challenges. Similarly, we need to position students um, with the activities of the classroom in such a way that um, they're encouraged to take risks, they're encouraged to take on responsibility, and they have that opportunity to experience failure and overcome that failure. And last but not least, we need to recognize that students come into our classroom with a variety of different levels of independence and that we need to address that differently dependent on who that student is and the concepts we're asking them to do. One way to think about this is by using Vygotsky's Zones of Proximal Development. Um, to uh, you know, summarize kind of this large theory of learning and position it within this conversation of failure, it's really emphasizing the fact that we need to provide students opportunities for failure. And Vygotsky poses there are essentially three different levels of independence that students can work at. At the very center of this is what students can already do on their own. These are the spaces that we as teachers really don't need to interact with the students in, um, that we just need to provide the nudge to say go forward because they're capable of doing the skills required without our assistance. That outer circle then is what the students cannot do in any situation. Uh, this is that uh, freshman uh, ensemble that is given Lincolnshire Posey, which exceeds their abilities as musicians to either perform or understand. Um, this is a space, likewise, that we want to avoid because not only will our students encounter failure, but they're encountering failure in such a way that they can't overcome it, at least not yet. That center uh, orange circle then is where we want to emphasize our instruction, which is uh, focusing on what students can do with our support. So when you talk about providing opportunities for failure, um, this is about initially positioning learning right at that edge, just on the inside of what students cannot do. This provides students perspective on where they can go and advances students for forward towards further learning. There's an important recognition when we're at that extreme outer edge of what students can do with support and that we need to recognize that we need to support our students strongly as teachers. There's a strong teacher hand in this by providing multiple different strategies for instruction. We continue to uh, provide opportunities for failure by getting students right up to the edge, right before what they can do on their own. And this is the point that we as teachers need to take that step back and allow our students to find success on their own. We need to provide them the ind independence and don't rush in to save them because they're working on going through their own struggles. At this point, when they're in that, what students can do with support, um, there's going to be things that they're not able to do fully yet. They need to encounter that and be able to go to the resources that they have, which include us, which include other students in the classroom, to be able to support them. So they learned how to overcome that failure they've identified. Chamber ensembles, sectionals, individualized composition, and other such activities are really a great way um, to challenge students into doing things on their own, positioning them in a spot where they are the music makers. Another aspect that comes into these classes is that they, it was an emphasis of growth over proficiency. Um, when we talk about creating proficiency-based systems, um, these are about setting benchmarks that all students in the classroom must meet. Um, we find that um, as we compare our strongest students and our weakest students, uh, those students who can succeed against those who are constantly failing, in a benchmark system, in a proficiency-based system, those who are strong students find themselves oftentimes very complacent and very bored. They don't need to work hard because what they're doing is already good enough. They're already meeting that proficiency that we're expecting them to do. By contrast, for that weak student, um, they quickly find themselves very frustrated because they have no meaningful path to move forward in how to overcome 
the failures that they're encountering. They're in that ring of students cannot do, um, not students can do with our support. By contrast, if we create classrooms that are built upon a growth mindset, um, we find that there's an expectation that regardless of where you're at, students are in a constant state of improvement. Um, and when we talk about that constant state of improvement, it starts from a position of what students cannot do on their own right now, what they're failing at, um, to being able to do activities fully and successfully completely on their own. Ideally, in our classrooms, we want students always to be living in this space of constant improvement where every student is responsible for moving forward, where critical thinking, where progress are embraced. Last but not least, we need to make sure that we provide students with models of how we appropriate re respond to failure. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about that idea of failure happens in the practice room. And the problem with that mentality is that student who is first encountering a failure acceptance mindset doesn't have the opportunity to see how successful people also fail. And this failure needs to be modeled importantly by the teacher, but also by the older students in the classroom. And when we're talking about this idea of having appropriate reactions, it's first of all, recognizing that there's an acceptance that failure happened. That's okay that you have failed. That's okay that you have not succeeded. And likewise, that there's a practice of implementing proper coping strategies for that. How do we respond once we fail? A key difference between productive and destructive failure is that destructive failure recognizes failure and then never moves forward again. Constructive failure, productive failure rather I should say, is about recognizing that it happens and taking meaningful steps to be able to address that failure. By moving students forward through uh, appropriate coping strategies, whoop, sorry about that, by moving students forward with appropriate coping strategies, we make sure that uh, they're able to identify failure and then overcome that failure. And we'll talk about at the very end of this presentation what those coping strategies are. I wanna share for the moment um, a student's reaction to what this looks like. And I don't have the student's voice, um, so I'll read it here for you just in a second. But importantly, um, what Lauren is talking about here is this communal experience of failure and that we learn through failure through the model of the teacher and the model of others. She wants to see what she needs to work on to improve us and make us feel comfortable by saying it's okay to fail. It's telling us that we don't have to play quiet. You don't have to be scared. We're all here as a family. We're all here to help you. You just have to let us know what you need. This idea of making our failures transparent and open is critically, critically important. And when we look at students who are learning through process of failure, the first step in this is just accepting that failure is part of that learning process. Um, this sign hung at the very front of the classroom in uh, one of the schools that I studied, and it was a constant reminder that before you succeed, you fail. Before you walk, you fall down over and over again. It allows the students to recognize what you don't already know, what you can't already do, and the importance of creating that space. Second, and as I mentioned it before, um, when students are learning through failure, it's through the collaboration with others. It's recognizing that there are many resources available and that the student themselves is just one of those. And learning happens in a classroom when it supports failure and it allows students to say, I can't do that yet. There's a resource circle that's built around the student and the teacher is part of that. But in addition, we have the student's peers um, who in these spaces that have accepted failure step forward and say, let me help. How can I support you? Similarly, the families are in place and encouraged to recognize the fact that everything isn't going to sound great. That's part of the process of learning. Um, one of the things that many of these programs did uh, were learning concerts where they demonstrated what the process of working towards a polished performance is. And the importance is that it allows the family and likewise the community to hear that we don't start perfect and we don't start flawless. And that Progress is noisy. Progress is oftentimes with wrong notes and that that's all right. And as students practice, that's going to be part of it. The, this circle that's around the student of teachers, peers, family, and community are important for the musical support, the technical support they provide the students, but even more importantly, providing the social and emotional supports that allow the student to recognize the fact that they're frustrated, allow the students to recognize the fact that it doesn't feel great not to succeed. Um, but there are, there are ways forward and making sure that that's something that's clearly and explicitly stated. 
Importantly within these classrooms, the students saw themselves as part of the change that needed to occur. Um, there was a relationship between myself and everyone else in the classroom. And regardless of who I was, I had a responsibility for everyone else and everyone else had a responsibility for me. When I failed, others stepped forward and said, let me help you, let me pick you up. And likewise, when I had observed failure in others, I stepped forward recognizing that they needed to be able to have coping strategies um, to be able to be successful. And that I could serve as part of that system for coping with failure to both accept it and then overcome it. So you may be asking at this point, okay, great, what are these coping strategies? Um, and we're gonna break these down around three big categories, social coping strategies, emotional coping strategies, and finally the, the technical musical coping strategies. Um, the technical musical ones are the ones that we as musicians oftentimes are already familiar with. This is how do we practice um, intonation problems? How do we practice rhythmic issues? Um, but before we get to the point of teaching students those technical skills, those practice skills, we need to address that we've created a space that socially supports failure and that we've appropriately addressed um, ways for students to emotionally deal with that failure. So when we talk about the social coping strategies, um, the first thing is putting community value in the process of failure. Um, making sure that's a shared failure, uh, a shared belief that failure is important and that we provide visual representations of that within our classroom. And when I say visual, signs certainly are part of that, but even more importantly, that um, we hear and we see examples of failure and people appropriately coping with it, especially for students who are newer to this process. As one of the students um, who is one of the section leaders um, stated to me in one of my conversations, in my section, I like to say, be Beyonce, because when Beyonce fails, she owns it and she just keeps going like nothing happened and she fixes it for next time. It means it's okay to fail in rehearsal and make sure you fix it for next time and you learn from your mistake. Um, the idea that failure can be extremely public um, was an important thing within these classrooms. Likewise, the idea that when we fail once, that becomes the uh, designation for us that we need to start working on it is important. That continuing to fail on the same thing is a destructive form of failure. But rather, if we're working progressively forward, that we've created something that's meaningful and constructive for our students is an important step. Second, when we look at this idea of social failure, um, it's building um, a space that embraces respectful discourse around failure. This is modeling how we talk with others. Um, importantly, we recognize that failure is an action. Um, it is not a thing or a person. I have failed at this task as opposed to I am a failure. We need to make sure that we remove the negative connotations that failure has and reinforce the fact that failure is a step in this process. That when the word fail is used, um, it's as an acknowledgement of an action. It's an acknowledgement of an experience as opposed to something that is permanent. Um, when we talk about failure, it's around the idea of growth and that once we fail, we can now start moving forward as opposed to being stuck in that failure forever. And a key uh, component that happens within these classrooms is that there's a peer mentorship that happens. Um, and this peer mentorship is not you are the section leader, it is your responsibility to work with the younger students, but rather a responsibility that everyone is a leader for someone. And this comes from recognizing that we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. While you certainly have the student that is the most dominant success in the classroom, the, the trumpet player with the highest range, the clarinetist with the best dexterity, we also need to make sure that we recognize that there are other musical skills in place, the ability to diagnose issues, the ability to talk through problems, the ability to problem solve, um, that may not cohabitate in that same student who's the strongest performer, but that that student is able to then support their peers. Um, an important aspect in these classrooms is that there's a permission for students to collaborate with one another during the rehearsal. These were not silent rehearsals and they were not the director on the podium dictating the details to the students. Rather, students were able to turn to one another and say, hey, I've got an idea, here's a solution. And while there were certainly ways to communicate that the teacher needs to be the center of focus at this moment, more often than not, while the teacher worked with one part of the ensemble, students were working with each other. And this encourages this mentorship that addresses failure at its root and allows students to move forward in real time. It's a recognition that every single student has strengths and every single student has weaknesses. 
Now, importantly, um, even in a classroom that accepts failure, even in a professional musician who accepts that failure is part of the process, um, there's an emotional element that comes with failing um, that is absolutely and totally appropriate. Even when you accept it, failure doesn't feel good, even when it's okay. And it's perfectly all right to say that you're not able to do something. Um, when we talk about the coping strategies, the emotional coping strategies for failure, the important element that comes in here is recognizing um, the way that we emotionally respond. It is perfectly acceptable to be disappointed by the failure we experience. And that's the statement of, you know what? You're not there yet. And the key piece there is yet. There's a growth that's in place. By contrast, we want to avoid the angry emotion. You just suck. You're a terrible musician. You're a terrible person. You're not able to do this. And this is about both embracing the growth mentality, but also um, moderating the sort of emotion that we have to make sure that's appropriate to the situation. Along the same lines um, is the importance of recognizing that frustration happens. Frustration is natural when we put in hard work to move forward. Um, and it's perfectly fine for a student to say, but I've worked so hard. I don't know why I can't do it yet. The flip side is making sure that we, um, it, within these emotional coping strategies, play down the extremely negative, destructive emotions, the hopelessness that comes with it. I've wasted my hard work. And the difference between I've worked so hard and I've wasted my hard work is the designation of I worked so hard and I still need to keep working hard versus I'm done, I can't move forward. Do we embrace failure as a permanent state or do we recognize the fact that even in our frustration, it is a temporary moment? So the general rule, emotionally speaking, with coping strategies is about de-escalating the emotion. It's perfectly fine to say failure doesn't feel good. We don't need to celebrate it and say, congratulations, Michael failed today. But we do need to recognize that it's something that's natural. This comes through really strong modeling by older students and importantly by the teacher of how to cope and move forward. When the teacher makes the mistake from the podium, when the interpretation falls apart, when um, the conducting gesture doesn't work the right way, the teacher doesn't hide that, but rather says, that was my mistake. I know that uh, we've worked on it, but we need to work once more because I've made that error and here's how I'm dealing with it. The social supports of the classroom are so critically important for building the space that embraces failure. It tells students that you are not alone and it tells students that you can overcome this challenge. We can accept the frustration, we can accept the disappointment, but we can't move into that space that failure becomes a permanent state. Last but not least is then getting to the actual musical skills. And these are the, the practice strategies that hopefully we teach already. Now the important piece when we talk about teaching musical coping strategies for failure is recognizing that students are not naturally accustomed to doing the complex system of breaking down a problem um, identifying why it's happening and getting to a solution. And we need to model for our students three very important steps. Um, the first of these steps is identifying the specific error. And it's not enough to say something happened at measure 39 as we ran it, but rather being able to specifically get to the nuts and bolts of exactly what happened. Um, as I played through this, the rhythm is falling apart. I'm pretty sure that I'm not in time. There's an offbeat here and I think Think I'm putting the offbeat in the wrong spot. I'm not 100% sure. The second step in this is then diagnosing the cause of that. Students like to jump right past the diagnosis once they've identified a problem. Measure 39 is a problem, so I'm going to use chunking to fix it. By contrast, though, we need to make sure that students become aware that every tool doesn't fix every single problem. And understanding exactly what the cause of that problem is oftentimes leads us to a solution. So while the student may be able to identify that measure 39 has a rhythmic issue in it, the diagnosis gets down to the fact that uh, the section is in a compound duple meter and they're feeling it right now as some sort of a simple duple, which is making that uh, quarter eighth, quarter eighth rhythm impossible to play. They can continue to work at it as long as they want, but if they don't diagnose the cause of that error, the fact that they're feeling it in duple meter when, or in a simple meter when it's in a compound meter, they're not going to be able to overcome that musical error. And last but not least, we need to prepare our students with meaningful strategies for being able to specifically fix problems, specifically address their failures. Um, this is systematically applied. 
And in some cases, it's a specific tool for a specific cause. We can also teach broad general skills, things like simplification, tempo alteration, um, chunking, that allow students to focus on a small section of music, make sure that that's perfected, and then build onto it from there. Without these three sets of coping strategies that address social needs, the fact that we're part of a community and we failed in that space, how do we create support systems? Emotional needs, it hurts to fail. And how do we deal with that feeling of disappointment, that feeling of frustration? And then specific musical technical needs. How do I move forward now that I've identified this failure? Our students will not be able to overcome failure. Um, or at least they'll have to figure these things, the social, emotional, musical coping strategies out on their own. If we provide that support, if we provide the modeling and provide meaningful opportunities for students to experience and overcome failure, they develop as part of who they are. So you might be asking at this point, well, what are some things I can do Monday morning to bring um, failure accepting practices in my classroom? I think first and foremost is embracing the concept of self-reflection. Students need to recognize what it is that they do well. Likewise, they need to recognize what they fail at. And that self-reflection serves as a key piece to this. Now, this can be done in a variety of different ways. This could be uh, a writing assignment, an exit slip at the end of a class. It can be something that's talked aloud. Let's reflect on a specific performance we just did. But throughout this, the teacher starts by modeling what good reflection looks like. And gradually, that responsibility is turned over to the students. I um, mentioned earlier um, today the idea of failure lists, and I really, really love the embracing of this idea. The idea of a failure list is simple. Whether it's something that's a shared Google Doc or the whiteboard as students walk in, students specifically identify what they're failing at, what they are not succeeding at. And this could be specific measure numbers, could be specific concepts, but this then becomes a shared list um, that is visible to everyone. Um, in some cases, maybe students sign off on, this is my problem. In others, this is the communal list. But this becomes the rehearsal plan moving forward. This becomes the way that students are able to contribute to the classroom, um, as well as a way for teachers to be able to reflect on what it is that their students most need to work on. Um, a, moderate, a modification on that failure list is the idea of an open rehearsal plan. And again, this allows the transparency of the classroom to happen, that students can see the way that teachers think, and likewise, teachers can make sure that we're responsive to our students. Um, when I've done this, it's as simple as uh, posting a Google document that all the students can access through our classroom management system, that they can add their own elements into the lesson. Here are the things that I would like to work on today. Um, in some cases, this may be the students actually taking responsibility not only for identifying those, but teaching parts of those. Um, giving them the chance to model the sorts of coping strategies for overcoming failure as it happens. In a little more informal sort of setting, um, this idea of whack-a-mole is one that I think is great. If you think about the old carnival game with the moles that pop up that you have to hit the hammer down with, essentially you create a classroom that looks the same way. Uh, we empower our students at any point to be able to stop the rehearsal and say, you know what, we've got a problem. Can we please fix it? And at that point, the responsibility of the classroom transfers from the teacher to the student. This serves two purposes. One, it makes sure that students are constantly critically aware of what is happening in the classroom. Are they listening to the musicianship of the classroom and are they responding to it? Second, it gives students an opportunity to model what good coping strategies are. How do we overcome the challenges that we've got? Can we identify the problems? Can we work communally to support those issues? And we, can we do it in a way that doesn't emotionally attack ourselves or other students? Decentralizing rehearsals is an important way to do this as well. Uh, and this is about allowing students when not being worked with within the entire class to be able to work with one another. The social context is so critically important in the failure um, supportive classroom. This idea that I am here to help you, you're here to help me. As part of that, we have to be able to recognize that failure happens in the midst of our rehearsals and before and after during individual student practice. We wanna make sure that students can rely on those resources at any time to say, I've got a problem and can we please address it right now? Um, in order to do that, we have to create systems for communicating. Right now, this is a whole class activity. Now this is a decentralized rehearsal. I'm working with the clarinets, which now allows you to work with your own section. But again, it allows students to model that best practice for one another and to be able to support each other. 
Um, chamber experiences are critically important as part of um, moving students towards independence. Um, in the chamber setting, students are going to encounter failure just like they do in the large ensemble. But the difference is the teacher is no longer immediately there to be able to support that. This is the proving ground for the students of uh, whether they've been able to um, be su find success through failure, whether they're able to appropriately apply these coping strategies without the support of the teacher. If you think about those three circles from the Vygotsky um, model, this is putting students right at that edge between what they can do with support and what they can do completely on their own. For um, students as they go home, it's critically important that the houses that they go to, the communities they head into, recognize that failure is part of the music learning process. Um, as a parent with uh, two relatively new uh, band members in his household, or I should say band and orchestra with two first year musicians, um, it can be really difficult to listen to the wrong notes. It can be really difficult to listen to them problem solve through the issues as my daughter continues to find the wrong uh, third position shift for her pinky finger to go to the high D on her uh, bass. Um, one way that we can help parents and the community that's around our students understand what failure supportive learning is, is to do that demonstration concerts where we uh, put on not only finished pieces, but also pieces that are in progress. So they're able to see how we address those issues uh, as teachers, what those experiences are like, what are the sounds that come from musical development, what are the sounds that come from the trial and error that's part of being a musician, and how can they support their students as they head home. Importantly, there is a message that we need to give our students, and that message is it's okay to fail. It's not okay to sit on that failure. It's not okay to say, I am a failure. But in the process of developing expertise, we want to embrace this space that says, it's okay to fail. And likewise, we're here to support you in that. This is just the first attempt in learning. I welcome any conversations, discussions that you might like to have. Uh, feel free to reach out to me by email as well. Uh, and thank you for joining us for this presentation here today.